Hey guys, welcome to To Zag or Not To Zag, Strategic Considerations for Alternative Beverages, where today we are going to be talking about Strategic Considerations for Alternative Beverages. The spoiler is right there in the title. No, no real surprises here. Uh, but today, I don't think it's any secret that the entire craft beverage industry has really been transforming, even the fact that I'm able to say something like that. Craft beverage industry. Most of us got into this, and this was the craft beer industry, but over the last few years, we've seen an enormous uptick in the amount of non-beer products that have not only been entering the space, but have become absolutely intrinsic to what we consider the prototypical brewery, the prototypical beer industry. Things like hard seltzers, things like kombuchas, things like ciders, wines, meads, pretty much everything in between. And that's really opened up an entire world, not only of new customers, but of new innovation, new technical challenges and new challenges from a branding and marketing perspective. That's what we're going to be covering today. But I am fortunate enough to be joined by three people significantly more intelligent than I am. So I'm going to go ahead and let you gentlemen introduce yourselves to my right. And I'm only presuming you're all seeing the exact same uh, quadrants that I am. We have Dave Thornton. Go ahead and introduce yourself, Dave. Yeah, I am uh, David Thornton. I'm one of the founders of Carolina Bowen House Brewery and Winery. Uh, the name Bowen House means farmhouse. That's our commitment to regionally grown seasonal ingredients. Uh, so in addition to making beer, we do make cider, mead, some types of fruit wines. Um, we've made a few seltzers here and there. And then I also um, uh, was a partner in uh, Blue Ridge Brinery for a while there. And we make and distribute kombucha, beet kvass, uh, as well as different types of probiotic ferments, pickles, sauerkraut, kimchi, uh, you name it, we dabble in it. Uh, so We're in uh, Greenville and Anderson, South Carolina. It's a shame you guys aren't versatile at all and absolutely no diversity in your ferments. Um, <laughs> Towns, how about you, bud? Yep, my name's Towns Moser. I'm the founder of Lenny Boy here in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, mostly we make uh, beers, uh, ales, lagers, sour beers, um, as well as kombucha. Um, kind of to David's point, uh, we dabble in a little couple other things too, but uh, just mostly for the tap room for some experimentation and just to kind of keep all the, the brewers and creators uh, actively, you know, inspired and doing different ferments. You know, brewers are artists, so you got to keep them engaged and that is easier said than done. Brian, how about yourself, sir? About as far from being a brewer as you can be, but uh, still creative. Tell me a little bit about uh, your work. Well, uh, uh, Beer, aficion beer drinkers, for sure. Beer aficionados for a long time. Uh, so I'm Brian Winkler, uh, founder of Robot House in downtown Oklahoma City. We are a boutique uh, brand development and storytelling firm uh, that we work with all kinds of companies, but we've been building a specialty in craft beer and craft beverage over the last couple of years. Um, Robot House has, we've given it meaning, but it actually uh, is a, an in-joke from an episode of Futurama uh, so any Futurama fans out there might remember it from 20 something years ago. Um, but yeah, we're, uh, we're just a, a small five and a half person shop. Um, we love beer and we love telling beer stories and being a small business. We love working with small businesses, uh, and, uh, uh that most brewers are that have that passion behind it. Uh, and then sometimes those small businesses get large and, and have big corporate partners and we play with that as well. Well, we'll definitely dive into that here in a second. Nothing like uh, te teasing a little bit. Um, I should probably introduce myself as well for any of you who I haven't managed to annoy over the years. My name is Aaron Gore. I'm the Senior Director of Business Development for Bivana, working with small beverage companies across the world to continue to grow, develop, and reach new customers. But back to the topic at hand. Uh, one of the first big decisions for any brewery that's looking to go into something non-beer, whether that is seltzer, whether that is cider, something that's outside of that beer vertical is just on deciding what brand to run it under. Now, Brian, I know, you know, being from a marketing background, one of the 22 immutable laws of marketing is the law of brand extension. You know, you can only carry that brand equity so far, but... Uh, can you go ahead and dive in a little bit on what are some of the considerations of going into deciding whether or not you're going to run that new product under, say, a Carolina Bowen House versus running it under something entirely uh, created from the ground up? Sure. Uh, and uh, what's interesting with with our story with Coop Aleworks, which is our our, our biggest uh, beer client and the biggest brewery in uh, in Oklahoma, um, we launched a hard seltzer with them 
in 20, I guess, 2020, early 2020. And, uh, uh, right before the world shut down, and yeah, uh, happened that year. Yeah, but it was it was not Coop Hard Seltzer. It was Will and Wiley Hard Seltzer. Will and Wiley Oklahoma Hard Seltzer, I think, is the actual mm -hmm. on the on the cans. Um, and uh, and if anybody asks, it's not named after Will Rogers and Wiley Post, who both died in a plane crash, and who we had have two airports named after them. Ironically, it's very dark here in Oklahoma um, uh, because apparently, I, I think. Wiley Post is not yet in the public domain, so don't tell anybody I said that. Um, but essentially, the thinking was uh, working with Sean uh, Mossman, who is then the, the marketing director at Coop, uh, the decision to not launch a specifically branded by the brewery hard seltzer was that the thought was that the hard seltzer audience that they were going after weren't necessarily, even though they were the biggest brewery in the state, weren't necessarily going to be immediately familiar with Coop as, as a brand. And so, uh, so the thinking was, let's create an entirely new brand uh, brewed by Coop Ale Works, but have a big uh, launch so that there's not, since there was the idea that there wasn't enough brand recognition, we could invest in creating a new brand for specifically for the hard seltzer audience. And that makes a lot of sense. Uh, but from the opposite standpoint, uh, David, I know that for your Carolina Baron House products, you know, you guys have played in more categories than just about anybody I can think of in the industry. It's, uh, you guys are more of a true fermentory than you are even just a traditional brewery. So what was some of the, the thought process put behind putting everything under that Carolina Baron House name? Was it about building that as your brand? So i got to give you a little bit of backstory, which is that before we were Carolina Baron House, we were actually um, a yeast company called South Yeast Labs. So yeast came first. That's actually how I met Towns. We um, put together um, a native SCOBY. So we isolated the various strains of Acetobacter, Lactobacillus, strains of wild yeast, and we're able to make something that made pretty good kombucha. And I think these are wild blueberry kombucha it was awesome. Uh, so my first pivot was starting a yeast business. Um, I had to have a brewer's license. And pretty much by like month three of the yeast business doing like two to $5,000 of revenue and the brewery doing like $40,000 in a tiny little three barrel brew house, that I built myself. I'm a bioprocess engineer. So I worked in biofuels and then um, kind of got into beer later on through my work with Clemson University. My, my real mission is, is being able to make uh, farm-based products, like a, a profitable profession to grow agricultural products. So that applied to the bioprocess engineering is value-added processing. And that's how we get beer and that's how we get cider. So my wife and I run our two farm locations we grow everything from fruit trees to nuts, berries, vegetables to make pickles out of some small grains. So anything that we can grow in this region, that's what we're doing the farm to fermenter process. So really it's, um, it's a, it started as a passion project, but it's, it's grown out of control, sort of like my, my passion for it. And, um, you know, everything we do is still in a very small scale. Our largest batches are seven barrels. Um, and we might just do seven barrels a day as a like a peak production in a day. So, um, and a lot of times it's it's less than that. So, I'm not sure if I answered your question or not there. But the well, first, I, I think, I think you did. You really uh, you really put the hit the nail on the head. I, I think, or at least put the uh, the pin in it that you know you guys were always conceptualized as more than just a brewery, and you guys have leaned on that almost since day one. You know, it's more about pure fermentation. Uh, Towns, from your standpoint, you guys had a little bit of a different track. So you guys actually started with the kombucha. First, can you describe what SCOBY is for any of our uh, viewers who have no idea what the hell SCOBY is and come strictly from the beer background? And then <laughs> talk a bit about some of the challenges of going from kombucha, a up and coming and developing category into something a little more established like craft beer and some of the challenges that were there and some of the opportunities that were there. Yeah, so uh, SCOBY is a symbiotic culture of bacteria and yeast. So yeast and bacteria work together to ferment something uh, and then create um, different esters that, you know, uh, become kombucha. Um, so it's a, ours at least is, is a really dry, um, acidic product. 
Um, so just crisp, clean, and easy drinking. Um, but yeah, I started out uh, brewing kombucha originally, um, commercially. And uh, I guess our biggest thing was I saved up $10,000 and just kind of bootstrapped together, um, you know, uh, a system that would work for brewing kombucha. Um, so that was back in 2011 is when uh, we sold our first bottle of kombucha commercially. Um, so my, you know, my biz- biggest challenge was, you know, I was 20, you know, three or so years old, uh, just trying to navigate uh, what the heck I was doing. There was only um, three other, three or four other breweries in Charlotte. Um, and, you know, North Carolina has grown 300 plus now. I don't know what the number is, but there was uh, only a couple breweries really at the time. Um, so I leaned on a lot from uh, the guys up at Old Hickory, Stephen uh, up at Old Hickory. He was one of my first mentors. Um, he'd been in the game for a while. But uh, yeah, so, you know, saved up $10,000 and started, you know, producing com- commercial kombucha. Um, and then, you know, kind of beer was always in in the back burner but as most everyone knows making beer is uh the equipment's very expensive and the hookups and the plumbing and all that all that fun stuff the meps are um can be challenging so it took us a while um about a year a year or so in january of 13 we i think we got our microbrewers permit for beer um, so really just needed to get some money coming into the company to then obviously reinvest back into a, a, a brew house. Um, so we did, we, in 2014, we got a three and a half barrel Portland kettle work system and worked off of that for two years before we moved into our new spot in 16. Um, but yeah, challenges were obviously you want to keep all of the, the, the funky acetobacters and all the stuff in kombucha out of the beer. So that was obviously always a, a challenge just with, you have to have separate equipment, separate pumps, hoses. So it's, you know, we're one company with two different kind of operations within the, the facility. So that's kind of how we kept it at the old spot. We started with a 2000 square foot um, space and then we got the next unit over and put the beer on that side. So We've kind of just as we've grown and, and moved to our new location in 16, we just kept everything completely separate. Um, and that's kind of just how it's it's kind of law around here that nothing, you know, cross contaminates and everything like that. Which is always a, a safe bet from a technical standpoint. But I n- understand that there's also some legal concerns as well, depending on the type of product that you're creating. Uh, David, can you talk a little bit about some of the challenges that go even just to something as simple as the permitting process? Uh, yeah, so Barnhouse is three separate entities, our, uh, our uh, winery side, our brewery, and then the pickle side is actually at, at another location. But um, at our Anderson location, our, our building is split, two separate addresses. So the winery is its own business, it's like 115A and the brewery is 115B. You walk inside, you wouldn't really notice you're in two different businesses, but they have to be separated by a wall and you know certain restrictions like that. And then we also have different tax rates. We also have South Carolina has different laws. Um, one of the things that really pushed us, I mean, we, I've made cider for my own personal use for decades, but um, in, in opening a brewery, we realized that the distribution laws were, were pretty whack, favoring uh, keeping a middleman in place with large margins. So I'm not going to hop on any political pedestal there, but wineries, changed the law back in 1996 to make a domestic winery um, policy for South Carolina. So if you use 60% local ingredients, you can self-distribute, you can send it by mail. So I can deliver kegs, cases, um, all kinds of, between my locations, I can deliver from one place. Um, So we went with opening a a winery. It really helped that one of our co-founders was an attorney who's now actually a pretty well-established brewery and um, alcohol licensure attorney through this whole process of seven years. Uh, we just celebrated our seven year anniversary this week. Um, Woo. Yeah, we hope seven more. <laughs> uh, and then the, the brinery side of it too, the insurance is different. Also the brinery is like every kind of microorganism you do not want in your beer most, most of the time. Um, so we have a lot of like open crocs and fermenters and kombucha and, and stuff like that. That's at a separate location. It's also some separate regulation. It's regulated by Department of Agriculture down here, whereas um, 
with our brewery, um, we're with SLED and uh, TTV. So um, we have different insurance policies, liability policies, um, you know, facility standards, and that just helped us um, keep everything separate so that you know, under one brand, but legally it has to be separate. You got more questions about that? Let me know something specific. <laughs> no, it sounds like it added a significant yeah. layer of complexity, but by the same token, added a uh, some opportunities that otherwise, especially in South Carolina, you wouldn't have with a strictly beer pro uh, product because the regulations and the laws are different. Uh, Brian, I mean, obviously, you've also worked with products that are uh, going back to your original point about Will and Wiley that are aimed at two different types of consumers. Do you see entering some of these non-beer products as really opening up opportunities to reach customers that otherwise your traditional beer products wouldn't necessarily be able to get to either technically or just from an interest standpoint? Absolutely. Yeah, I think especially as uh, from a generational standpoint, you know, I, I, I try and do as much research in terms of what's going on and when what's what's next and uh and it, it's 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 sounding like most of you know younger millennials gen z that they're really more interested in you know rtds more interested in you know in in things like hard seltzer you know that uh and so i think having as and and even even na beer i think you know and that's something as a 52 year old I appreciate so that I don't fall asleep after, you know, a, uh, a nice, a nice warm stout or a nice stout on a, you know, in a, in a warm room on a cold day. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think, you know, as the space matures, you know, and just in sort of the crazy growth of hard seltzer and that's, you know, been a little bit of a roller coaster, but, and then as, as RTDs have grown, uh, I think it's a matter of, you know, there aren't a whole lot of craft beer, strictly crappier people that are diving into hard seltzers, right? You know, it's like beer people for the most part are beer people. So I think really expanding uh, the palate when possible definitely gives the opportunity to expand the, the target market and expand the you know, potential fan base. Well, and I think that's always a challenge, especially in some smaller markets. I mean, Oklahoma City is a decent sized city, but it's also not the largest craft beer market. Being able to extend your reach wherever possible is valuable. Uh, Towns, obviously, you're working with an entirely different category, one that's not even alcoholic. Uh, but both your kombucha and your beer are both branded under Lenny Boy. Do you find uh, value in being able to market those together or are you effectively marketing both of those to entirely separate customers? Um, there's a little overlap, you know, there's, uh, when we first started, um, even our microbrewers permit at the beginning, I was super green. I was young and, and dumb and I don't know if I'm too much smarter now, but, um, it, it was Lenny boy kombucha originally. And then once we started, you know, diving into the beer, then I had to get the, the TTB name changeover. So that was a process logos updated all those fun things so um yeah i think for us starting out as kombucha uh it kind of got the name out there originally and so we didn't want to totally alienate and have two different brands when even our kombucha brand wasn't a household name by any means uh, at the time so um but definitely you know some hurdles there like you know we like I said, we were doing kombucha for about a year, year and a half before we did the beer. Um, so we have found over the years that even even now, some people still think, oh, Lenny Boy just makes kombucha. And then if they either come into the tap room or see, see us at a festival or something like that, um, they're like, oh, wow, I didn't even know you did beer. And I'm like, yeah, well, we've been doing beer for like, you know, nine, ten years now. So um, there's definitely been some ups and downs with that. Um, I think if we ever do expand and do something else, uh, you know, larger than just our tap room, that will probably ha we've got a couple other brands that we've been working on just to totally segment it. So if there's a third leg to this company, like it's, you know, kind of like Brian was saying, it's a completely different entity with on the back, small words, you know, Lenny Boy Brewing Company. But um definitely been some confusion and and even with uh you know the distribution of it you know our our beer is just in north north and south carolina um and mostly just around charlotte 
Um, we're in a little bit of Charleston, a little bit of Greenville, um, just touches here and there. Uh, but, you know, distribution laws, as, as David was talking about, uh, in every state are all very different. Um, but on the kombucha side, there is other challenges, too, with uh, being in the natural products world. Um, those distributors, you know, people gripe about beer distributors and alcohol distributors. It's kind of the same way uh, to uh, another degree with some of these other uh, natural product distributors like uh, UNFI and Albert's Organics and stuff like that. They're great. Don't get me wrong, but they're 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 big beasts. So there's a lot more red tape. Uh, a lot more chain of commands uh, when dealing with some of these other uh, distributors and also the kombucha is completely cold chain. So that <laughs> uh, kind of nightmare that creates. Uh, yeah. If, yeah. If so in here watching us who owns a brewery, just think of all the areas that you don't necessarily have uh, refrigeration on your beer at a given point in the process and start crying now. Yeah. So just cold chain is a whole nother hurdle to deal with. So um, the the beer distributors that do carry our kombucha um, have cold chain. Um, but, you know, it's it's still like for Charlotte, even just local Charlotte, there's no, you know, county by county law of who can distribute. So you might have uh, a Whole Foods that has one distributor. You might have your mom and pop that has another distributor. You can, there's, you know, within Charlotte, you can kind of pick apart eight different distributors that have different accounts and all that stuff. So navigating that isn't as, as easy as well. There's a lot of different loops and, and who, who gets your product, how do they get it and those type of things too. So. So let, let me go ahead and first propose that if you guys decide to rebrand anything, take the beer and change it from Lenny Boy to Lenny Man. Uh, that one's for free, by the way. Uh, feel free to use that. Uh, and GABF gold medal winning in 2022 beer, by the way, uh, which yes. you forgot to mention. But uh, aside, aside yeah. from that, but diving in on the distribution question now, obviously with beer, we're very familiar with going through the three-tier system. That's something that's kind of baked into our psyches and the way that we operate as an industry. Brian, you've had the opportunity to see a company grow its distribution significantly. Towns, you just touched on the fact that you can have parallel distribution and that NA doesn't necessarily uh, follow the same rules. David, I'd be curious, especially being in South Carolina, you alluded to the fact that your wine products don't necessarily have to pass through the same... Uh, strictures as beer when it comes to distribution, but can you speak a little about how you guys have decided to distribute your products and any unique opportunities or unique challenges that that's presented? Yeah. Um, we just have some special relationships right now. You know, our, like I said, our operation is really small. Um, we're typically less than, you know, our, our peak is maybe around 700 barrels in a year for that's total wine and beer combined. So we're, we're very much a niche. Um, devoted to the experience in our tap room. I mean, we want you to come into our tap room, sit in our barrel cellar, eat some food from the farm. So it's, it's not, we're, we're so different. I mean, I love like the people on this panel here. We have three very different entities that we all run and they're all part of this really great um, system that works together, like we benefit and collaborate by each other's products. It's, it's perfect. Um, yeah, I don't know. We're yeah, definitely in the industry. <laughs> But I do think that's that's valuable is just looking at it from from three very different angles. Um, so, Brian, do you want to talk a little bit? I know, obviously, you're not on the sales and distro side uh, with your largest client at Coop, but across your portfolio of clients, what have you seen as far as some of the unique opportunities or challenges that they've faced or some of the areas that you've really been able to help them uh, get product out there and get awareness out there uh, since distro can be so tightly regulated in certain parts of the industry? Well, we kind of actually sort of lucked out in, like I mentioned, you know, launching the hard seltzer, uh, you know, right, right at start of pandemic. Um, and only a couple of years before that had the laws changed in Oklahoma. So we had archaic laws dating back to like the 20s and 30s, and it was like written into the Constitution. So it had to go to a vote. So we were one of the only states that only you could only buy three two beer in mm -hmm. grocery stores and uh, and convenience stores. Uh, strong beer had to be uh, to be sold warm at only at liquor stores. Uh, and so, uh, since when restaurants and bars shut down, 
luckily those laws had changed a couple years earlier. And so we've got Walmart, we've got, you know, kind of, you know, the, you know, big box stores as well as liquor stores, you know, so, uh, so that definitely helped in terms of otherwise I, I, I think our growing craft beer, you know, community probably would have shrunk considerably not having those opportunities to, to sell, you know, on, you know, uh, in, in stores. So, uh, so yeah, so far, I think really mostly, um, a big ask for us with some of the, uh, 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 uh breweries that we work with most recently, Skydance Brewing, a native owned brewing, uh, uh, brewery out of uh, Oklahoma City, uh, four blocks down from us. So really, we have, there are actually five tap rooms in walking distance from our uh, from our studio. So it, we're, we're kind of, you know, living a charmed life down here. But um, uh, really, it's been a, mostly about uh, our, our part of it is the design part is, you know, the uh, there's been become there's so much competition in the space. It's, you know, the art, what art, what we're solving really is how to stand out from a visual standpoint, from a storytelling standpoint, um, which ties into sales. And like, you know, a, a, again, you know, we don't work on sales or marketing strategy specifically. It's more creative storytelling strategy. But really, it's about, you know, uh, assuming that the sales folks are able to, you know, figure out, you know, distribution and all that. It's for, uh, you know, for us, it's really about what can we uh work with a client to build something that is going to stand out and and you know amongst all the hyper local craft beers and uh uh have somebody you know want to pick it up and check it out and see if they're not familiar with it you know see you know see what uh see what it's all about from there excellent i, I love the idea of story driven marketing i'm robert mckee fan i'm presuming but uh yeah that storynomics is is Valuable, but I want to dive back into to kind of the the big example that you have within your portfolio here in a second. But Towns, before we do that, uh, can you talk a little bit about some of the differences or, or even some of the unique challenges that come from managing non beer wholesalers versus managing the kind of wholesalers that most of us are familiar with in our day to day business uh, in the beer industry? Yeah, so I mean the beer beer distri distribution side, you know. I've we mostly do boutique distributors. Um, we don't have any bud houses or anything like that. So, um, you know, I can email the owner or the head, one of the head guys in charge of the dis distribution and kind of have a, a candid quick co conversation on the phone or an email or anything like that. On the other side of it with the natural products world, it's, it's very challenging just, um, having those fluid conversations and the red tape and, you know, all of these extra things that you have to go through. Um, for instance, like right now we're, uh, moving away from our bottle to a can. Um, so fantastic, uh, by the way. thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so we're doing, you know, uh, a whole pack change. So we're going from a 14 ounce clear glass bottle to a 12 ounce sleek can. Um, and with our, you know, some of our distributors, the mom and pop type distributors, they're like, okay, cool. Yeah, we'll sell through this product and then we'll start picking up the pack change and, you know, kind of a lot easier. Um, some of the big national products uh, distributors, they have like a hard cut date, like December 15th or whatever it is right now of, all right, that day is when this stops and when the new uh, pack change uh, takes over and whatever's left in inventory, you, you know, either get billed back at a high rate or, you know, what can you do? So that's what the fun challenges we're doing in December right now is the pack change. Yeah. So just, you know, it's a lot more rigid within the uh, natural products world um, and getting those distributors and keeping those relationships and running promos and sales, um, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot of additional paperwork and time and lead times and all those fun things that we, we love doing. So um, there's, you know, pros and cons to both beverages and uh, you know, you're just kind of, kind of one foot in front of the other when it comes to these things. But yeah, the pack change thing has been a, a, a long uh, strenuous thing for the past five or six months that we're going through. But we're almost through it. And, uh, you know, I'll probably have more to say about that in the next month or two of, of kind of how some of these things filter out. All, all I'm hearing is a sequel. 
for this uh, <laughs> down for that. But I do think it's important to drive home for folks uh, who, who haven't worked with some of these uh like producer or food distributors and brokerages that the sheer scale of them. I mean, even Bud and Miller house is pale size wise in comparison to something like MDI or Unify, like they are absolutely mm. massive organizations. And with that comes a level of impersonal built up impersonality uh, that you're not going to necessarily see out of a boutique wholesaler. Yeah. And, and I guess one other thing that that is, is your sales cycles too. So, um, you know, on the, the beer side of things, at least in my experiences, you know, you can throw in new products, give them, you know, a month, two month, three month lead time, stuff like that. Um, some of these sales cycles on the natural products uh, world are 12, 12 months, 18 months, two years. Oh, and then a buyer uh, that's in the corporation. You've made a relationship with them. And then, oh, now they're now they're buying lettuce instead of buying you know, beverages. So they do a lot of rotation uh, within their company as well to keep them, I guess, trained up on different aspects of what, you know, could happen within their company. So making those personal relationships and then, you know, having them taken out from on you and, oh, you know, Johnny's now buying lettuce and and Sally's uh, the new buyer. So it's uh, it's an interesting world. So keep an eye out for Lenny Boy branded romaine coming soon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> tap rooms are great. <laughs> I love tap rooms. <laughs> oh well, Brian. Speaking of uh, working with and interfacing with large uh, corporations, let's go ahead and uh, talk about the uh, the hundred thousand million pound gorilla in the room, which is over your right shoulder. Uh, Sonic Hard Seltzer, a product of uh, Coop out of Oklahoma City. Uh, that's been one of the fastest growing seltzer brands of the company in the country, if I'm correct. It's uh, top 11 in the country right now. I don't know if it's cracked even further than that. Been growing like crazy and up against a national launch. The thing's only been around for like two years. Can you talk a little bit about the process of working with a company of the scale of uh, uh, Sonic and, you know, above even them, they're... Um, they're part of a larger organization as well. So I can only imagine that there's been some level of cooperation, but also of contingency there. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and it was sort of a, you know, one of those, uh, you know, whatever the opposite of a perfect storm is, you know, everything kind of clicked together. Uh, uh, Sonic, most folks don't know, originated in Oklahoma City. And even though they are part of, I forget the name of Inspire the day, National Inspire Brands, and it was something with two syllables brands. Um, <laughs> they uh, uh, they still have headquarters down here uh, in uh, in the Bricktown area of Oklahoma City. And so everybody knows somebody who works at Sonic because we it's it's the, one of the biggest small towns in in the country. Um, and yeah, yeah there's another Beaumont over at uh, Sonic. Who I do yeah. know. <laughs> Um, so, uh, uh, so yeah, so basically it was a case where Coop had Will and Wiley for that, you know, for 2020 cherry lime based on uh, Sonic's cherry limeade was their top seller. Uh, there was a top secret. We were sworn to secrecy. We put together some layouts for them to pitch a Sonic branded Will and Wiley cherry limeade seltzer. And that conversation turned into Sonic hard seltzer. And so that's where you know, uh, I, I guess early Q1 2021, uh, it was launched. So it's been less than two years uh, on the market, launched here locally, and then starting to build out regionally. Uh, and yeah, it was really a case of, you know, the uh, uh, what we had done for Will and Wiley, very, very much the aesthetics of hard seltzer, right? You know, white, clean, you know, pops of color. Um, and so we tried to sort of in the first layouts they sent us the you know the uh the brand guide and it's all these candy color stripes and all the all the new stuff they read their sonics recently uh updated their brand um after decades um so took that kind of tried to find a happy medium sent it on uh you know the coop folks loved it sent it to the sonic folks and then the sonic folks are like did you read our brand guide you know so it was really like this this is not a marriage this is like this is sonic this is full you know so we kind of had to go full sonic on it uh and so luckily the cool thing is you know that second round um it was like yeah this is this is what it needs to be so so the uh, the cool thing is they they really have a strong um kind of partnership program for for these types of brand relationships uh so it ha didn't necessarily have to 
go through, you know, multiple, multiple layers of folks, you know, it, it got straight to the top pretty quickly with, you know, great folks to guide us in terms of, of how to uh, approach, how, how to really integrate the, 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 the Sonic brand in the space, which was kind of risky for them because especially a automotive, you know, the origin being kind of the, the Sonic, you know, drive-in, had this sort of car based brand family brand that is now dipping into you know alcohol with you know drinks uh so they uh they had to really navigate a lot of things in terms of uh especially uh franchisees that was a big thing um because the, the first question anybody asks when they find out sonic has art seltzer is you know can you get it at sonic and no you can't you know um so that's kind of their, their biggest brand hurdle it really was this is a product you get in stores, you know, and uh, it will on the the hard seltzer shelf with with you know and or kiosks or whatever. So, but yeah, luckily having the equity of this decades old, you know, quick service, you know, uh, international brand um, was, you know, it 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 was pretty cool to kind of play in that toy box and then see like Stephen Colbert make fun of it. You know, like Stephen Colbert had, you know, our layouts on his show, which was kind may, of may we all be so lucky as to one day be made fun <laughs> of by Stephen Colbert. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Goal, goals to hit. So, I mean, it sounds like it introduced an incredible amount of tools into your toolbox, so to speak. Uh, but also, I'm, I'm sure there were challenges above and beyond just the the dictation from uh, up top. How how much of a uh, how much of an effort has it been to really be able to keep up with the profile of something like this and be responsive to the needs of a third party that you are effectively licensing their brand equity from? Well, luckily it's done, it's done so well. And Coop has kind of been on a rocket ship since, you know, since the launch, they've, they've spun off, uh, Coop BevWorks is now the craft beverage wing of, so there's Coop Ale for the beer, Coop Bev for Sonic Hard Seltzer, uh, and just this year, we've launched Sonic Hard Southern Sweet Tea, uh, and uh, which I'm not a big hard tea drinker, but it's good stuff. Uh, and then Sonic Hard Slush is a, is the new, newest one. Um, and uh, and they've all they've even reached out. They've uh, uh, we're they're about to launch Tampico Hard Punch, and I'm not really familiar with the Tampico brand, um, but uh, and that's something that where we sort of worked on kind of pitch elements once it was, you know, the the contract was done, the Tampico folks kind of took over and then we've been sort of working hand in hand with them. So now we are essentially with the folks at Coop, not only working with the Sonic folks, but working with some folks over here, you know, with this other big brand. And so really, I think that a big thing is uh, how to maintain brand equity and especially I think with the, the Tampico stuff, it's a, it's a juice that kids drink. So, you know, how, how close can we get to what the non-alcoholic kid friendly drink looks like um, or how far away can we get from it, honestly, and while still maintaining those, those brand standards. So it's, it's really, I think just kind of navigating that and then really seeing, especially with Sonic, you know, there are a couple of other things we've been, we've done some, some tests layouts for how, you know, how much can the brand extend outside, you know, within the space, but, you know, uh, outside of just the hard seltzer space. So that's been uh, kind of a fun challenge that we've, we've been tasked with this year. Yeah. And definitely expanding, expanding into areas above and beyond kind of the original brief is always a challenge. And there's always a bit of a, a thin thread of holding uh, the brand hierarchy together. Now I will say with respect to the, uh, the hard Tampico, you know, I got a four year old who drinks non-alcoholic beer, so I think you'll be fine. Um, <laughs> but uh, Dave and Towns, uh, you know, obviously anytime you're introducing new products, there's always a risk of, you know, cannibalizing some of your own business. Now you're both uniquely positioned as, you know, everything shares a brand and everything is in house, but have you seen any, uh, any internal competition between some of what y'all offer or has it been entirely incremental to uh, your beer business as well? Or I guess in your terms, uh, town uh, incremental to your kombucha business, since that is the larger side of the company. Um, well, at least for us, uh, the only internal conflict really is what equipment do or, or investment do we, you know, go into next? Is it, 
something on the beer side, um, you know, a new tank or, uh, you know, whatever it may be, pump, uh, or on the kombucha side, do we invest into uh, a, a new bottling line, canning line, new bright tanks, you know, so that's kind of the, the only major internal conflict that we have is where to allocate funds to and, and what to, to bite off next kind of deal. Um, but otherwise, uh, you know, um, our kombucha brewers, um, they, they cross, they don't really cross to the beer side too much and, and vice versa. Everybody, you know, we have team meetings and, you know, overall, uh, you know, what's packaging that day or, or whatnot, um, you know, but there's not too many internal conflicts besides where to allocate money to and what to grow and what to push, uh, which I think is in any business in general. What about you, Dave? Well, our system is completely different. <laughs> We're uh, seasonal. So everything that we can get our hands on regionally, seasonally, over the course of a year, we might brew 200 different recipes um, between the cidery and the brewery. And that's just um, also that dictates our limit, too. So we may only be able to make 60 barrels of one batch of Perry um, or 30, I'm sorry, uh, two barrels of a batch of Perry or something like that. And then uh, it'll just be a boutique that we really try to push seasonally. So every day or every week in our tap room, there's probably three new products on tap. And that's the experience we're really trying to capture is like regionality, seasonality. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a different paradigm. Of course, there are months where we wish we could increase our revenues. And at one point we did have seven different distributors. And as you know, the climate changed a lot in the last two and a half years. So we were sending a lot of beer um, because we do specialty beers with like our, um, you know, my wife and I run the two farms. We have a hop farm as well as the fruit farm. So. We've got like some local South Carolina produce going into award-winning sour beers. There was a pretty big market for that, uh, you know, four to seven years ago. And so we were sending a lot of beer to Washington and Oregon and California and Nevada and Colorado and Illinois, um, Georgia. We're right now we're just in South Carolina and we sort of created our whole, our whole business model is, is really based on the limits of what we can produce agriculturally. Um, in a way that's, you know, it's really relaxing. You know, there's not that constant stress of having to grow and grow and grow. It's, you know, our first three years, we did have like a doubling of growth every year and we sort of plateaued, but we, we feel like we're at a really healthy place. Of course we do want to grow. That said, we have a, a tap room expansion planned in Anderson, put in a, a beer garden, which is long overdue. The beer garden in Greenville is, is a big part of our revenue stream being able to have 200 person events and, and stuff like that. Um, and then putting in a full restaurant at our Anderson location. We do have one in, in Greenville that ties into the whole theme of farm to fermenter or farm to table. Um, so again, we just have a completely different um, strategy for what dictates our growth. And uh, in the same aspect, our beer, our beer side, um, I've been on a Carolina Heritage Grains Council doing some advising for what we can get into the beer system. But seven years ago, you couldn't brew a beer with South Carolina grain. Closest you could get is some Appalachian wheat we grew for animal feed down here and got River Bend Mall House up in North Carolina, start malting some of that, some Renza Bruzy rye. Through that, we've now created a multi million dollar um, agricultural industry in South Carolina that grows for beer, and those products are becoming available. So we use 100%. South Carolina or North Carolina grown grain. We're still really loyal to the um, brands who started in North Carolina, like Epiphany Malt and Carolina Malt and Riverbend, who are growing everything in those two states and um, shipping it to us. So, you know, our growth is limited by what can be produced. And um, really, it's, it's telling that story better. It's taken seven years to tell the story like it is right now. And we still haven't gotten it all out of our mouth. So I like hearing everything about what Brian's, Brian's saying and thinking about that scale and how it might apply to what we're doing. And then at the same time, it's like, well, you know, there's only 600 pounds of this type of apple. It's going to go into a single bat. Then I don't have anything to worry about. There's like not as common. That's all there is. <laughs> yeah. So uh, hurry up and find out, you know, go get some prickly pears or some muscadines and let's get something else going. Um, as far as like brands competing though, uh, 
that's where this conversation started. It, it's just so different all the time. You know, sometimes we can't get a lot of fruit and we rely on honey. And that's what um, we really grow the mead side of the business. We found with the meads that the stronger, sweeter meads were very slow to sell. They're sort of like a novelty. You might get a bottle and share it. But when we started doing sizers, which are like cider and honey together, they range from four and a half percent ABV to eight percent ABV. Um, then those lower ones that are around four and a half percent, those were the ones that were really selling. And essentially, it's a it's a product comparable to a seltzer, but it's made from honey, local fruit, um, and that puts it under its wine category for us. So uh, we do seltzer-like products. We don't really make a seltzer. But if we have, it's been made from honey, fruit juice, beet sugar, basically anything from grain because the laws are so much favorable in South Carolina to the winery industry than they are to the brewery industry. And I hope we can get some equity in that. You know, we call we, we pushed for a farm brewery bill for years and uh, we're still we're still lobbying for some equal rights for beer um, in South Carolina. If only we knew some awesome people on the board of directors of the South Carolina Brewers Guild that could uh, be fighting for that advocacy, Dave. <laughs> uh, but I, I definitely, I mean, you're, you're telling you're telling a small story, and I think that small story is so valuable because speaking directly uh, directly to a very particular type of customer, but that, frankly, a customer like myself who's deeply invested in where a sense of place and where things come from and, and the background of them. But I think you pointed out something interesting is just how important accessibility in products are in the first place uh, with some of those lighter, easier drinking products being some of your top movers on the mead side. Uh, Towns, I know your uh, kombucha in general is intended to be a more accessible option versus some of the uh, the earlier entries, which were really either overly, not overly, but very sweet or extremely uh, acetic heavy. Um, but Brian, really, uh, you know, I think that's really kind of the story of hard seltzer as an entire category. What I'm really curious about, though, is with Tampico, with Sonic, with some of these uh, brands that Coop is doing and obviously are great for the bottom line. Are they seeing any of that either compete for focus with or provide opportunity for the Coop brand itself? Uh, so far, there really hasn't. It, it's been it's been mostly kind of separate uh, separate audiences for the most part. And even from the beginning, to, uh, building the hard seltzer brand, the idea was sort of to uh, attract, again, the non-craft drinkers, but potentially if there's a group of, you know, X number of people, you know, if 75% of them are beer drinkers, but a couple of them aren't, or they're the ones getting, you know, the Mick Ultra or something like that, or the, you know, the, um, you know the the vodka soda or something you know it was really about getting you know and or the you know the health conscious you know uh healthier conscious uh because around the same time uh coop launched their 99 calorie ipa which suddenly became their number two seller and their number one seller is their f5 ipa so that's you know that's that's kind of a, a take on their the 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 one style that they they've really grown i want to say you know it's it's i, I I think last I heard was like 40% of their of sales was is the F5. Um, so, uh, so, so far, uh, it's been something where the, they've kind of been different, different channels to a certain extent in terms of the approach of it. Um, but there has been talk since there has been such focus on the beverage side that uh, they don't want to coast on the uh, on the beer side and uh and that's where for us at least it's fun to play in you know with the sonic you know you know toy box um but we're not telling you know other than it being you know these you know unique products it's still sonic we're not telling sonic story sonic's telling sonic story you know uh and so we get to have fun doing the packaging design and kind of strat creative strategies there but actually going back into you know the what the stuff that gets us coming in you know uh every morning is is telling those specific stories that really do resonate with a you know with with a real person not that real people don't drink hard seltzer but you get what i'm saying in terms of craft beer in terms of uh of the, the relationship people have with their with their beers uh so um so that's where we i think can really sink our sort of creative teeth into. And I think something that we're looking to do with Coop is to 
uh, to kind of maintain momentum and and maybe even uh, sort of remind some folks, you know, what's special, what's authentic, you know, why they've been a big part of Oklahoma City and Oklahoma culture for I think it'll be 14 years uh, this coming spring. Um, so oh, that's uh, all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And what, what's what's cool is we uh, the, the, this spring will have been their agency of record for for seven years. So we'll actually have been with them for half of their existence. Uh, so which is is kind of a uh, kind of a cool thing. Uh, and also we were we were a three three person shop when they hired us, and we went up against all of the the shops you know locally with you know dozens or more you know uh on staff so we've kind of been you know the the scrappy underdog uh that partnered with the former scrappy underdog who is now kind of the big the big dog but still likes to you know uh you know stay tied to its roots awesome and i i, I do want to take a moment and also talk about the fact that you know we've been definitely diving in on sonic definitely diving in on some of the projects with Coop, but you guys have done quite a bit of brand work, not only for Coop before they started taking on these licensing agreements, but across the industry in general. Um, have there been any lessons from the brand side for some of these alternate products from some of your other clients? I don't want you to think this is all about, uh, you know, tight, you know, hamburgers and cherry limeade. Um, so far, it's uh, most of the folks that we've worked with are still really focused on uh, focused on the beer. Um, and, uh, we, we, we are working right now. We're, we're doing some, uh, uh, some work with a, a, a small family brewery out of Broken Arrow, uh, which is close to Tulsa, uh, called the Nook Brewing Company. And one of the products they've got is a, is a hard seltzer. Uh, so they're, they're playing around with that. They, they, and that was a case again, where, you know, and, and that's, it's funny when David was talking earlier in terms of engineering, like the rest of my family, all the guys in my family are engineers. Uh, you know, so I'm surrounded by engineers and I'm the creative guy, but, and then I wind up working in craft beer where so many, uh, brewers that we meet started as engineers and, and, and which makes sense because the science is, is such a part. I mean, that, that's, that's where it kind of lives or dies. And so it's kind of, it's just kind of funny how, how, you know, circular things can be. Um, but, uh, but yeah, uh, Alex at, at the Nook sort of didn't want to, you know, he wanted to focus on beer. He didn't want to do hard seltzer you know, did one wound up, you know, being popular with, with that target. And so, uh, so that's a case where it's sort of a sub branded, but they're keeping it within the, uh, within the Nook family. So, um, so, so far just in the scale of the, uh, since a lot of the, uh, other breweries that we work with are a lot of the smaller ones that are only, you know, a few years old. Um, so they're still kind of getting their sea legs to a certain extent with, you know, with their, their craft beer product. Um, but, you know, I think that everybody's eyes are sort of on what's, uh, what's next, you know, and, and what makes the most sense uh, from an authentic standpoint. And I think that's a big part of it is, you know, that it's, there's a big, I think probably a big difference between creating something because it feels like the right extension for your brand or creating something because it's a hot popular thing and let's, you know, let's, you know, make some cash, you know, while it's, <laughs> b b before it, before it cools down. So I think it's, it's sort of balancing that out, you know, and, and what cash is great, you know, but uh, and it's a scene that real people don't drink hard seltzer, but you know, they still have real money. So <laughs> yeah, for sure. So I have a couple more questions before Andrew hops back on here and tells me we're going too long, but uh, you know, talking a little bit uh, with all of you about, working in some of these alternative uh, products to beer. You know, we talked about those products themselves, but have there been any lessons, whether technical or, you know, practical or in a branding sense, Brian, uh, that you guys have learned from playing in those other, uh, those other categories? Dave, anything that you've learned from playing with me, playing with some of these alternative ferments, even playing with pickles that you've uh, found have also been additive to your beer, your beer side? Um. Yeah, and kind of touching on a, a question you had earlier and what Brian was saying uh, about products competing, you know, it's not so much competing in our tap room, but what I've seen, and it's kind of you know embarrassing to say, is like as me and my friends group get older, there's more emphasis on like health and longevity and the perceived health benefit of drinking a seltzer versus a beer. I mean, Brian, you probably know exactly what I'm talking about. So it's really like, you know, I do see that opportunity there. I, I'm going to call him out. My brother-in-law, you know, we got into craft beer together 
and he's the first one, you know, while he's in his keto workout mode, he's going to drink a seltzer or, you know, a vodka or something, but he's, you know, he puts the beer down for a while. Um, and that's led to us where our initiative in our tap room is really to provide an experience beyond beer. And I know that's not every brewery's objective and not every brewery can do that. And that is part of our initiative now to actually be more family friendly. When we opened seven years ago, we got a gold medal at GABF within a year of being open. And it created this momentum where it was just like we were the 21st brewery in the state of South Carolina. So we were a novelty. People would come from Atlanta, Charlotte to come get our beer. Now there's 40 breweries within an hour drive of our tap room. And prior to that, there were like five, you know. Um, so we've seen the saturation. We've seen how distribution works. And it is a hard beast to predict profitability and the margins are small. So we've chosen to focus on that taproom experience. And that means, you know, we make non-alcoholic ginger ale or um, root beer we serve in our tap rooms because we want to provide an experience where the kids or non-alcohol drinkers can still get that farm to fermenter experience, uh, but they don't have to drink alcohol and we don't have to sell somebody else's brand. And I will say that when we have ever run out of kombucha or had to buy any kombucha, we buy a Lenny Boy kombucha who conveniently uh, distributes through our distributor, Bear Island, down here. Their kombucha brand, I think your beer is through another distributor, if I'm not mistaken, but your kombucha comes through our beer distributor. So I know it's a great field to play in. We choose, if we sell anybody else's brand, we've vetted them, like like Towns over here, uh, who's come and brewed, you know, I think before your brewery was open, you brewed a beer down here with us and uh, made a nice rustic beer. So... I love the, the collaboration and the opportunity to work with folks like town and look forward to meeting you, Brian. Yeah. I yeah, appreciate it, David. Yeah. Um, yeah. Me and David have kind of, what, I don't know. It's probably been six, seven, eight, nine years now that we've kind of been fiddling around with stuff. And um, that's kind of one of the things that got me into, into brewing and, and making kombucha and all this stuff is the agricultural side. So um, before Right when I got out of college, I worked on a farm for uh, 10 months and was a farmhand uh, outside of Asheville, about an hour outside of Asheville called Mountain Harvest Organics and um, environmental science in college for a degree and all that. So kind of the agriculture really, you know, has been uh, on the forefront of what we do here as well. Um, but to David's point, too, uh, you know, that's another reason we did our event hall was, you know, selling selling products on site. And, you know, having that exposure and that margin um, has uh, really helped stabilize the business more and also allow for the wholesale growth and more tanks and all that stuff to, to you know, be funded. Um, so, you know, to David's point, too, that's why in our tap room we fiddle around with a lot of different stuff like June, which is a honey kombucha. Um, we do some seltzers. Uh, we've got a hard tea on right now. So. But again, it's not in massive scale. It's more of, uh, you know, for the experience when people come in that we have something different and we've got a little something for everybody. Um, so if, if they want something that's completely gluten free, they want something more on the health side, they want a stout that, you know, is a 10 percent stout that, you know, will uh, will fill your stomach up pretty fast. Uh, you know, we we pride ourselves on having a little something for everybody. So. Awesome guys. And we are unfortunately at time. I actually feel like we had a ton more we could actually cover on this. It's a broad topic. I hope we were able to at least do a little bit of justice, but uh, Dave Thornton, Carolina Baron house, one of the best breweries in the country uh, towns from Lenny boy, making some fantastic kombucha award-winning beer that I really wish more people would just get out there and try. They're absolutely crushing it. Brian Winkler. I know we talked a lot about some of the projects that you've been working on. They're high profile, but you guys are one of the top design houses in the beer industry. And, been on my radar for quite a while. Uh, so guys, thank you so much, everybody, for your time today. Thank you so much, everybody who tuned in. And yeah, keep an eye out for what's coming next from all three of these guys. Cheers. Thanks, y'all. It's good to see you guys. Take care. Darren, see you. Bye.